Welcome back to MedBoard Visuals, a focused primary care board review where you can relax and study for the boards at the same time. Now, we are presently in the cardiology section, congenital heart disease, subsection atrial septal defect, ostium secundum. And this is a primary care board review. Let us begin. All right, we're going to start off by looking at a key point with atrial septal defects called a fixed split S2. But why is the split S2, which is normally split during inhalation but not exhalation, now fixed throughout the entire cardiac cycle? That's the question. Let's start off by reviewing the fetal heart in development. This is the septum primum right here. And you notice there is a defect in the middle of the septum primum, which I will explain in a bit. Now this is the septum secundum. And just like the septum primum, there's also a defect. This has a name, the foraminal valley. The septum primum defect also has a name, the secundum ASD. All right, note the fetal lungs are not yet providing oxygen. So all the fetal oxygen must come through the umbilical vein right here from the mother. And as we're about to show, we can now see the purpose of the foraminal valley and the secundum ASD. They provide a passageway for oxygenated blood to enter the fetal systemic circulation without having to go through the undeveloped fetal lungs. Now, let's take a look at how this passageway normally closes. As the left atrial pressure increases, the septum primum, right here, is pushed against the septum secundum, which causes them to fuse together. The atrial septum then develops. However, when a defect occurs, the septum secundum fails to fuse with the septum primum. This leads to a failure of the foraminal valley to close properly in approximately 10 to 15 percent of cases like this. So this is considered a defect related to the ostium secundum. All right so now that we reviewed some basic embryology let's come back to the question why a fixed split S2? All right let's make up some numbers here. Let's say we have three ounces of blood in the right atrium and remember the left atrial pressure is normally higher than the right atrium, so the blood is going to flow from the left atrium to the right atrium. And let's assume there's 0.5 ounces of blood crossing that atrial septal defect. So the total blood that's going to enter the right ventricle is 3.5 ounces. So more blood on the right side of the heart is going to lead to it taking longer for increased blood volume to pass through the pulmonary artery right here because there's more blood there's extra blood from the left atrium now this is going to lead to a delayed closure of the pulmonic valve a fixed split s2 a longer delay for the pulmonic valve to close let's review s1 and s2 which is S1 is mitral valve and tricuspid valve closure. S2 is aortic and pulmonic valve closure. A split S2 is the pulmonary valve closing later than the aortic valve. Now, if we have the same volume of increased blood each time through the pulmonary artery, this is going to lead to a fixed delay in the split, a fixed split S2. Okay, now, we know, however, that inhalation increases the venous return. There's more blood coming with inhalation. So something doesn't make sense here. How can it be fixed if more blood is coming during inhalation? Shouldn't the split S2 get intermittently longer during inspiration? Not fixed. Again, the only way for it to be fixed is if we have the same amount of blood during inhalation and exhalation that is crossing through the pulmonary artery. So here we have three ounces plus a half an ounce plus a half an ounce. That equals four ounces during inspiration, but only 3.5 ounces during exhalation. 
the split S2 should be longer during inhalation. Something doesn't add up. All right, let's go over the answer as to why this is not the case. Okay, so here we have inhalation. And let's say, for instance, we have 0.5 ounces of blood entering the right atrium. Now, there is actually a dynamic process that's occurring across the atrial septal defect. It's not as simple as it may seem. If 0.5 ounces enters, guess what? 0.5 ounces actually exits through the atrial septal defect. A net zero. So we have three ounces plus a half ounce, and we still have a total of 3.5 ounces entering the right ventricle. And if we go back, this is the same amount of blood that was entering before we inhaled. It's still 3.5 ounces. So even during inhalation, we still have 3.5 ounces of blood exiting through the pulmonary artery. Therefore, the split S2 stays fixed because the volume remains the same. Okay. So what actually causes the murmur with an atrial septal defect? Well, the murmur is actually caused by the increased flow across the pulmonic valve, not the ASD. It's right here. It's the flow across the pulmonic valve. This causes a systolic ejection murmur at the left sternal border, the pulmonic area. Okay, so let's review some key points with an ASD, a secundum ASD. Number one, we hear a fixed split S2. And number two, left sternal border systolic ejection murmur due to increased blood flow across the pulmonic valve. Okay, now some extra points. Number one, we may see right ventricular enlargement on chest x-ray because of the increased blood volume. Number two, we may see right axis deviation and a right bundle branch block on EKG. Okay, so note with an ostium primum, this also has a fixed split S2 and a systolic ejection murmur at the left sternal border. However, because it is lower, it may be associated with tricuspid regurgitation and mitral regurgitation. The ostium primum is right here, notably lower than a secundum ASD. This is a primum. Now, the importance of this is that it almost certainly requires surgical closure and a significant possibility of tricuspid and mitral valve repair as well. Okay, let's now talk about something called Eisenmenger syndrome. But before we talk about that, we need to talk about what's normal with an ASD. So normally we have a net increase in left to right sided blood volume like this. However, over time, this is going to lead to right sided increased pressures and volume on the right side of the heart. That leads to a possible reversal of flow from the right atrium to the left atrium over time. This is what happens after Eisenmenger syndrome and is Eisenmenger syndrome. It's the reversal of flow causing cyanosis because deoxygenated blood is traveling from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. This is the right to left shunt that we see with Eisenmenger syndrome. Okay, now this is more likely to occur with large ASDs than small ASDs. Makes sense. It's also relatively uncommon at the time of diagnosis, fortunately. But as you know, Eisenmenger syndrome is considered irreversible. Therefore, surgical eval for possible closure before Eisenmenger syndrome actually develops. All right, let's now discuss paradoxical emboli. So here we have a blood clot in the legs. And as you see, it's crossing into the right atrium and it gets to the left side of the heart because of the ASD. That's how it gets there. And from there, that emboli can actually travel through the aorta 
to the systemic circulation and possibly cause a stroke or peripheral emboli. That's how a paradoxical embolus can occur. All right, this now brings us to the end of this video, atrial septal defect, ostium secundum. Join us now for the next video in the cardiology section. And as always, subscribe, press like, and ring the bell for notifications. Thank you from MedBoard Visuals.